And I have the pleasure of announcing another badass undergrad, um, Emma Jones, who is a student uh, in environment and national resources. And she's presenting on work that she did to bring restorative justice principles into conversations around natural resources. Okay, thank you for that. Um, today, my name is Emma Jones again, and I'm going to be talking about how the principle of restorative justice can be used kind of to reframe the way that we talk about natural resource communication. And so to begin with, um, I'll just give some context as an introduction and talk about why communication matters in the first place, and especially in the context of Wyoming. First, I think one of Wyoming's greatest strengths, in my humble opinion, is that people are really connected with their natural environment. People really care about the way that we manage our natural resources, like our waters and our public lands, um, and basically just the land that we live and work on. And um, I think this is really important um, context to consider. And, and people, even there's a a study by the Ruckles House Institute at UW, which found that nine out of 10 people in Wyoming think that conservation issues, so like public lands and water, are just as important as any other issue, including like economics and um, health policy. So people really value um, natural resource issues um, as a central part of their lives. And so that's why I think that communication about these issues is a really important part um, of our culture and our policy. Um, so, um, at the same time as we value natural resource communication, I think because people care so much about their perspective on natural resource communication, that can some, oh, what was that? Oh no. Okay. The microphone's still on, but I think a lot of times that can lead to tension in certain areas when communication fails. So I've included some examples here of both successful communication and um, instances where I think um, communication has gone awry. So up in the, the right-hand corner, you have misinformation steers the public's outrage at the BLM's plan for the Rock Springs area. BLM is the Bureau of Land Management. We have fury over Wyoming wolf torture allegations sparks demands for steeper, steeper penalties and reform. And so here we have two examples of an instance where um, public engagement has been driven by a lot of anger. And anger isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially when we talk about, you know, harms that have potentially been done. But in these instances, I think that um, a lot of times when people feel like they're not being heard, so like when people feel like agencies like the Bureau of Land Management aren't listening to their interests or they feel like they don't have the power to like actually um, be heard by the people who are driving policy, I think that a lot of times that can lead to tension that's not really productive and it can lead to a lot of greater issues down the road. Um, alternatively, we have success, um, especially um, in areas around water policy, which is something that everyone has an interest in. Um, we see that when we include stakeholders, as with the example in the bottom left, um, you can reach agreements that make people feel as though their interests are being heard. So public engagement um, is really important because it drives our culture, it drives policy, and so I think doing it in a productive way is really essential. Um, with that being said, um, Decision making right now, how many people have heard of NEPA or the national? Okay, so a few of you. So basically, um, when we talk about decision making, we have sets of guidelines for how we do that. Oh, my image isn't working. Oh, well. So, so we have a set of guidelines that basically guide the federal, state, and local land management agencies um, that are making decisions. And so at the same time as we have these regulatory guidelines for how we're going to do like environmental impact assessments and how we're going to include the public in the process of decision making, we also consider um, how these play out, how these policies kind of play out at the local level. So one of the guidelines for things like NEPA um, is stakeholder inclusion. And an important way to frame that is asking the questions of like, what are the trade-offs and interests of each community member or group? So what does a rancher value about access to public lands? Or what does an outdoorsman value about that? And then again, moving into that question of value, um, it's asking what is important about a particular issue or what do people in each individual community value and how are decisions going to impact them? So right now we have this regulatory framework that's like, 
um, pretty hierarchical when you look at it. So we have agencies um, and commissions like the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission that really are the ones guiding public engagement. And I think at the same time as it's important to have that framework, a lot of times it can lead to people maybe feeling like they're not being fully included. So that's important to consider as we kind of move forward. So where does restorative justice come in? What the heck even is restorative justice? Um, it's used in a lot of different ways um, and it's it's played out in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think what would be most helpful for people who maybe haven't heard of it is like an example. So let's say that... Um, I don't know. Let's say I'm bored and I like egg someone's house. I have nothing better to do. Um, <laughs> so in like the traditional justice system that we see, especially like in the U.S., maybe I um, I'm handed like a fine by a judge or I receive like some community service hours by, you know, whoever's in charge of penalizing me for what I did wrong. Um, so that's kind of like a traditional idea of justice. Under restorative justice, we take a different approach that's more community focused. So maybe I egg someone's house and instead of me just like getting a, a fine or whatever, I get to be in a circle with all of the people that I've hurt. So maybe the person whose house I egged and maybe they decide they they get to tell me you know, like this is this is the harm that's been done. And then together we come up with a solution that's going to reduce the future harm. So maybe they decide, well, I want you to clean the eggs off of my house and I want you to like mow my lawn. So it's really the whole idea of restorative justice, no matter how it's used, is the idea of when harms are done, you're focused on like a community effort to finding solutions. Um, and we've seen it used a lot, especially at UW. Um, it's kind of been implemented in kind of those like smaller, like disciplinary actions. In environmental harms, a lot of times it's used like after like maybe a river is polluted, we get together a, a circle of community members who've been affected to discuss what's been wrong, what's been done wrong. Um, and so really it's just an alternative to our traditional idea of justice. At the same time, um, as restorative justice is trying to accomplish a community-based approach to like addressing harms, there's a lot of critiques about it, um, especially the idea of it being used just as like a convenient tool. Restorative justice has a lot of roots in indigenous practices like talking circles. Um, and from that perspective, it's more than just a tool. It's really a way of being rather than just a thing that you do. Um, and so this quote, I think, sums it up. There are significant issues associated with indigenous justice, particularly the ways in which mainstream society or governmental structures may be appropriating these traditions and even using them as a means to recolonize people. And ultimately, I think what the main critique is, is when we implement this sort of thing, are we actually like including people? And I think especially when you have like organizations that are very hierarchical, it's hard to just like flip everything on its head and implement this. So I think really it's just about um, being mindful of am I actually using this in a productive way? Um, and I think there's a lot of potential for integrating it in a more holistic way. But again, we have to be mindful of like how we're using it. So as kind of a, a, a little informal case study in Laramie, um, I held a pretty informal talking circle with people um, from around the community to talk about water in Laramie, which I think a lot of people um, value a lot, um, whether you're just like a citizen or whether you're active when it comes to like environmental activism. And so here's an example of the kind of the way that we form a restorative justice circle. So we talked about the core issues around water. What are the biggest challenges to the future? And then everyone got a chance to speak about what the impacts were on them. And I think really that this, this is probably one of the most productive ways that I thought of using restorative justice was um, it's about building sort of a common ground of what people care about in order to then maybe talk about, oh, what are potential solutions to some of the challenges we've talked about? So really it was about finding common ground. And then some quick reflections. Um, obviously, there are a lot of ways to implement restorative justice into different settings. I think the main strengths that people discussed afterwards after the circle was that they felt a sense of community with the people around them. They felt like being able to like have an equal voice rather than just speaking maybe to an official. They felt that that gave them a greater sense of accountability. 
On the other hand, again, I think there's a lot of work to be done for this to actually be effective in whatever setting you apply it in. Um, and people have to be going into a discussion on like the same footing if it's actually going to work. Um, so ultimately, I think what's really necessary for this kind of thing to work is you can't just throw restorative justice into an issue or a conflict and expect it to work or expect it to have good reception because there has to be like a baseline of trust right, for any of this to work in the first place. And I think that's important for communication in general is people have to understand where each other is coming from. So I think there's a lot of ways that you can see this play out, um, especially in Wyoming. Um, the UW Ruckelshaus Institute is really focused on collaborative decision making, which is basically just using neutral parties to facilitate dialogue between stakeholders who maybe have a lot of different interests. Um, Another way of that we can kind of consider implementing this sort of thing is through interdisciplinary knowledge production, which is basically focused on like including the knowledge that community members have um, at a local level to then address large scale problems. So I think we see a lot of themes from restorative justice in different practices, even if it's not like we're naming it as restorative justice. And kind of as a conclusion, I think um, from the process of like doing these the the circle um, with community members and from trying to understand restorative justice, I think really in general, the, the important thing about communicating effectively with the people around you is having trust and having buy in and having a prior knowledge base. Um, and I'll, I'll just read this quote. Um, which I think really sums it up. Restorative justice has long emphasized the need for skilled facilitators, significant investments in preparatory work, and buy-in from all key players. And I think in general, that's where restorative justice might be able to shine is in um, kind of implementing this idea of trust early on when it comes to natural resource issues, which do have a lot of um, a lot of stakeholders who at the same time have a lot of common ground. So yeah, thank you.